Hi, everybody. Are you ready to worship? Why do we worship? Well, I was thinking about that the other day, and I decided that we gather together to make a statement about God's love, um, to make it to ourselves, to make it to the world, about God's love and God's mercy, God's sovereignty. We gather because we have to. Not we have to from outside imposed on us, but we have to inside. Because if we keep silent about God's love for us, fine, even the rocks would cry out, right? And it's good that we do it in community because we are at different stages of growth, different places on our faith journey, different levels of maturation. Some of us are very new to the faith. Some of us may have gone to church for years, but now all of a sudden it's making sense to us in a new way. And being in community helps us process that and gives us companionship along the way. So wherever you are on your faith journey, you know, you're welcome here. And we're glad that you're here. So our centering or grounding questions for today, they're kind of long, but I think you'll get at it. Hopefully it will stimulate some um, conversation if you're with someone else or some thought inside yourself. You might want to journal about it. So when the time comes after I re read these, you may want to hit the pause button um, and uh, spend as much time with it as you want or as you are comfortable with. And then when you're ready, release the pause button and we'll move on to the call to worship. But here's the thought for today. Was there ever a time in your life when you were starting something new, maybe a job or a relationship, and you weren't sure it was the right thing to do? You know, you're starting it and you're not sure it's the right thing to do. And if so, what did that feel like? Did you even think about maybe, oh no, I've made a mistake, I need to go back? Whatever happened as a result of that decision, whatever decision you made. So here it is again. Was there ever a time in your life when you were starting something new and you weren't sure that it was the right thing to do? If so, what did that feel like? And whatever happened as a result of that decision? Okay, ready? Pause. Please join me in our call to worship now by reading responsively the bolded print on your screen. Listen, O people, to holy teaching. Tune your ears to hear God's word. We gather to proclaim our sacred story, to tell of God's wondrous deeds. Come, O people, into holy space to worship the Lord, our sustainer and guide. Let us turn to God in prayer and praise. And let us begin with our opening hymn, Here in This Place. Here in this place the new light is streaming now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space our spears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. 
call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Please join me now in our prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. Every time that we acknowledge our inability to go through life on our own, God reminds us that we are not alone. Gracious God, we thank you for being ever present with us. We know that we are never alone. Your mercies have been faithful and rich. Pour out your spirit upon us that we might do the work of your will. Let us call to mind those ways in which we have been less than our best and ask God's forgiveness. For all the times that we have not trusted you, almighty God, give us the grace to be truly sorry. For all the times that we have not spoken up for justice or worked for peace, merciful God, forgive us as we admit when we have fallen short. for all the ways in which we have hurt others by what we have done or what we have left undone. Awesome God, free us from the trespasses we have committed. For all the times that we have thought that we were in charge, faithful God, remind us how to be faithful followers. For all these things and those left unspoken, loving God, give us pardon and peace.
Let us pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are on a journey that comes in stages throughout our lives. Let us remember the truth of what Jesus brings to us. Through your spirit, we are born again. Through our faith, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading again today is from the book of Exodus and continues the story of the Hebrew people living in the wilderness. Here we see not only human nature played out in the complaining of the Israelites, but also God's faithfulness in meeting their needs through their chosen leaders. Listen to God's word for us from the beginning of chapter 17 as it is written in the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Masa, meaning the test, and Meribah, meaning the quarrel, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Here ends our reading for today. Thanks be to God. If we were face to face in the same room, I would open this up with questions to you for you to answer as a, sort of a means of reminding us about our Bible history, because those of you who've been with me for a while, you know that I like to do that. And so the first question is often, um, what was the first gospel written? Which one? And if you said Mark, Ding, 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 you're right. Mark was written somewhere um, around the year 70, and we know that because that's when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, and there are references there that we can pretty much date Mark there. And then over the next 10 to 20 years, we have Matthew and Luke who, that were written down, and uh, the last one, John, was about 10 to 20 years somewhere after uh, Matthew and Luke. And um, we see similarities with all of them, but they were they all came out of oral traditions from the time of Jesus and uh, different communities sprang up around those uh, oral traditions. And finally, as the first generation that knew Jesus was dying off, people started writing down the stories and, and uh, that's how they came to be written. 
So Matthew and Luke took Mark's story, because Mark was first, and added to it. And uh, they were writing to particular audiences, these um, communities that had grown up um, around their tradition. Uh, Luke was a very Greco-Roman group, community. And Matthew's was a very Jewish community. Luke's community did not have the background in Judaism that Matthew's did. Matthew, writing to a Jewish community, um, wanted to make sure there were a lot of references in there that Jewish readers could relate to, especially when it comes to interpretation of the law. Who has authority over it? Who can practice that authority? And today's scripture is really four short stories, four scenes, if you were plotting it out in a movie, four stories, and it begins as Jesus and the disciples are heading back into Jerusalem for the last time. Um, this comes at the end of the gospel and leads us into the narrative of Holy Week eventually, the Passion of Christ. So keep that in mind as I share today's reading with you from Matthew 21, beginning at the 18th verse. I'm reading from the Good News translation today. Listen for the word of God to you this day. On his way back to the city, early next morning, Jesus was hungry. He saw a fig tree by the side of the road, and he went to it but found nothing, nothing on it except leaves. So he said to the tree, you will never again bear fruit. At once the fig tree dried up. The disciples saw this and were astounded. How did the fig tree dry up so quickly? They asked. Jesus answered, I assure you that if you believe and do not doubt, you will be able to do what I have done to this fig tree. And not only this, but you will even be able to say to this hill, get up and throw yourself into the sea, and it will. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus came back to the temple, and as he taught, the chief priests and the elders came to him and asked, what right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such a right? And Jesus answered them, well, I will ask you just one question, and if you give me an answer, I'll tell you what, by what right I do these things. Where did John's right to baptize come from? He asked. Was it from God or from human beings? They started to argue among themselves. What shall we say? If we answer from God, he will say to us, well, then why did you not believe John? But if we say from human beings, we are afraid of what the people might do because they are all convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you then by what right I do these things. Now, what do you think? There was once a man who had two sons. He went to the older one and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. Yes, sir, he answered. But he did not go. Which one of the two did what the father wanted? The older one, they answered. So Jesus said to them, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John the Baptist came to show you the right path to take, and you would not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not change your minds and believe him. Listen to another parable Jesus said to them. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to tenants and left home on a trip. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. The tenants grabbed his slaves, beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, the man sent other slaves more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, 
he sent his son to them. Surely they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and we will get his property. So they grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Here end our scripture readings for today. Thanks be to God. As we reflect on how we might be like those early Israelites in the desert and where we fit in in these stories that Jesus told, let us sing together hymn 822, When We Are Living. must give good works of service are for offering when we are giving or when receiving we belong to God we belong to times of sorrow and in times of pain when sensing beauty or in love's embrace whether we suffer or sing rejoicing we belong to God, we belong to God. Across this wide world, we shall always find those who are crying with no peace of mind. But when we help them, or when we feed them, we belong to God. We belong to God. Please pray with me. Holy source of of all, the one to whom we turn when all else fails, and the one who calls us to new life. Help us to know and truly believe, as we just sang, that everything we do, we do in Christ Jesus. Every challenge we face, every success we have, Every time we fall short, it's all in you, O Lord. And so we ask that you move us to where you wish us to be, so that this time together may be all that we need and all that you desire for us. We pray in your holy name. Amen. 
when I started preparing for today, I thought for sure I was going to focus on that great reading that Nancy did from Exodus. I mean, there's so much human nature in it, don't you think? People are saved from unthinkable conditions, and after a time, they turn around and they complain about their accommodations. What did you bring us out here for, Moses, just to die? We could have done that in Egypt. Where's the food? Where's the water? We should have stayed right where we were. At least there we knew what to expect. But there's an interesting phrase um, at the beginning of the reading, and it says, From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. Now, just to be clear, the wilderness of sin is not uh, referring to some metaphoric or symbolic understanding of sin as we think of it today. Though to be sure, it is an apt way to think about life, isn't it? Emerging from the wilderness of sin. But in this case, sin, or sometimes spelled with a Z, zin, um, was a region in the Near East. It was a dry and sandy wasteland in the southwestern part of the Sinai Peninsula, Sin, Sinai, same route, um, in, kind of in the region of Mount, Mount Sinai. And it was one of the six wildernesses that the Hebrew people trekked through during their 40 years in the desert. But it is a nice image for our spiritual journey, isn't it? Ultimately emerging from the wilderness of sin, the wilderness that sin puts us into. Yet it's actually the second part of that opening verse that struck me this last week. It's that the Israelites and us travel in stages as God commands. Just to be clear, we're not talking about stage coaches. We're talking about stages or plateaus or levels of awakening, for instance. And just as the Hebrew people traveled in stages and then would rest for a while, we too travel on our spiritual journeys in stages for a time where we're accumulating, accumulating, trying new things, trying new things, and then we rest for a while too. We need to. We have to have those moments where we can assimilate everything that, that is coming to us. Sometimes I think of these plateaus after I've had a learning streak, a spurt of energy and revelation that's followed by a time to rest and get used to the new understandings. I, I think of them as the plateaus where I can integrate everything into my life in a, in a new way. Well, nowadays, I tend to think more in terms of a spiral dance where I'm learning and growing and deepening in my relationship with God. And perhaps because I recognize familiar territory, but it's not the same. It's not like I'm going on a circular journey because I have changed. So I'm, I'm a little removed, but everything is familiar. But those are still stages, whether you're thinking linearly or um, spirally. So while we could spend a whole long time on the Exodus reading, I'd like for us to take just that one concept, this idea of moving in stages of growing and developing in our faith and see how that affects our understanding of the gospel according to Matthew. As I said when I was reading it, there are really four parts in today's reading. Jesus and the disciples, or J and the D's, as I used to call them in my teens. <laughs> J and the D's are heading into Jerusalem. They have been traveling together for about three years. Just imagine how close they were. And then maybe imagine how frustrated Jesus might have been with the fact that even after three years of 24-7 being together, teaching, they still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. They didn't get who he was. They didn't get what the job was. They didn't understand the message. And they sure as heck weren't expecting what was going to happen to him and to them in the next week. So as they're walking into the city, they pass a fig tree. Now, mature fig trees can bear fruit once or twice a year. But young trees, young trees take many years to even bear one fig. It takes a lot of maturing before there's fruit. Jesus would have known that because figs were common in that time and in that place. 
And so here he comes along. He's hungry. He wants a fig. And then when there's not one on this tree, there are only leaves, zap! It's toast. It withers up and it dies right in front of their eyes. And the disciples can't believe this. What is he doing? But Jesus' whole response is to try and get through to them one more time. It was put here to bear fruit. It didn't. But if you believe, you will bear fruit like a mature fig tree, and it will be abundant. You just have to believe. And I can't help but thinking that he was saying to the disciples, come on, you guys. You are supposed to be the spiritually mature ones around here. I've poured my heart and soul into you for three years, and you're still not bearing the fruit of understanding? Then they get into town. They go to the temple. And when the temple leaders question his authority, instead of answering them, he asks them another question. Quintessential Jesus, right? It's the way of the rabbi answer with questions. And of course they can't answer it, the whole thing about John the Baptist. They never can answer those questions because they are living to the letter of the law, not by the spirit of the law, not out of their own relationship with God. They want the cut and dried, black and white answers in life, kind of like middle schoolers. I used to teach middle school. Just tell us what to do, tell us what the rules are, and then we'll know the answers. We can memorize the answers. And I was trying to get them to think and not memorize answers. But instead, Jesus gives them, these leaders, a story about a man who has two sons. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Could it maybe be God having the sons who were the temple leaders? who said all the right things but didn't do them. And then Jesus and his followers, who everybody thought was saying all the wrong things because they didn't agree with the temple leaders, but they were the ones who ended up doing the father's will or mother's, as the case may be. Any parents of teenagers will recognize that kind of behavior. I will not do that. I am not going to do that. Are you crazy? Why would I do that? And then when we're not there, they do it. Or others who say, sure, mom. Yeah, I'll take care of that. And they never do it. We can only hope that they do the right things even when they say they won't. And that brings us to the fourth story where once again, Jesus is, I think, talking about himself and trying to get the disciples and by extension us to understand, understand who he is to God. A father has this vineyard. My reading, I would probably say a mother has a vineyard, but regardless, the parent has the vineyard. And that sure sounds like God to me. And the parent gives it over to people to take care of and to monitor it. Maybe those are religious leaders, or maybe they're political leaders of some sort, or maybe they're just people he happens to know. And, and, and the owner goes off, maybe on vacation, we don't know, leaves town. When the time comes to gather in the harvest, the people who were there, the ones who, who were in charge, who were supposed to be tending everything, they wanted more. They weren't content with what they had from the master. They were conniving and scheming to get more and more and more, cheating, stealing. Whenever somebody would come to remind them of the master, that everything really belonged to the landowner and not to them, to collect food for sharing, for instance, they killed the people whom the master sent. I don't know why they killed them. I would guess that part of it was because they were emissaries of the master 
who reminded these people on some very, very deep level that the master was in charge. And they knew that what they were doing was wrong somewhere in there. That was in opposition to the master, in opposition to what they had been taught were the values of their community, and they wanted more. And they convinced themselves they deserved more. Ill-gotten gains. Doesn't that sound like the state of the world? I mean, really. Whether we're talking about Jesus' time when corruption in the temple was huge, or we're talking about our time when corruption in other places is huge. The people who stand up to remind us of what we are supposed to believe, of what we say we believe, the ones who are, in this case, doing the Father's will, they get beaten up, killed, whether literally or figuratively in terms of their careers, they are dispatched so that the corrupt and thieving tenants of the vineyard can get more and more and more for themselves. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, Ambassador Maria Jovanovich, leaders of the FBI and the CDC reminding us of the values that we say we hold. It's the same dynamic that Jesus was preaching about, but he was talking about himself getting killed. He was the son sent by the father, and the people had no respect for him either. The disciples may not have understood it that day, but I bet within a week it made sense out of this story for them, don't you? But today is all about stages. We mature in stages, and I'm sad to say so does our country. We have been like middle school students, just wanting easy black and white, yes, no, good guy, bad guy answers to things. We have fooled ourselves for hundreds of years into thinking that there are those easy answers. When how could there be easy answers when we are such a complex society? That's part of the beauty of us, our complexity, and we can unite around common values. Some have become so focused on the letter of the law that they've forgotten the spirit of the law. When it comes to politics, too many of our people approach it like teenagers rebelling against or defying authority. Everything is a game. Who can find the loophole in the rules to win? Who can change the rules and cheat without getting caught? That's what my middle schoolers did. Calling the ones who do what's right, loser, sucker, that's what my middle schoolers did. They were 11, 12, 13, and 14. They weren't leaders in our country. And when the father sends the son to everybody, they kill him. It makes me wonder and pray and grieve about how many times is Jesus crucified again in our nation today? How many times? How many times do people calling themselves Christian lash out at others, exhibit no humanity, no forgiveness, no welcoming of the stranger that Jesus preached? and taught and died for. How many times does God weep over what we are doing? Just like that father must have wept over the death of his son. I don't know about you, but 
for me, it gets to the point where I don't really care about all of these little things. I just want us to move on together. Let some things go. I'm willing to. Let some things go so we can all move on. You know the good news in all of this? Thank goodness we are still growing. We may be in a stage right now where things are terrible, but the more we spend time individually and as a faith community, deepening our connection with God, the, the more we grow within ourselves, well, then the closer we will become to advancing to the next stage in our spiritual growth our spiritual maturity. And with every step, with every stage, maybe we get a little closer to the end of our wilderness journey, our journey through the wilderness of sin. Maybe we can get past the point of saying that it was so much better the way things were, whether we're Israelites whining about not being back in Egypt in slavery, because at least there we knew what the dangers were or where Americans nostalgically pining away for the quote, good old days. You know, remember those good old days? The times when blacks drank from different water fountains and were lynched? When women couldn't get their own credit cards without their husband's income, even if the woman earned more? Thank you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for getting us past that phase. Spiritually mature people, those connected to Jesus, those growing in the spirit, we become the mature fig tree that bears fruit. The fruit of the KOG, the kingdom of God, the relational God. We are the ones who are proud to say, sure God, I'll be happy to do what you ask. Send me, put me where you want me and show me what to do. We are the ones who recognize the Son in our presence, and we acknowledge that we live under His authority, His rule, His terms. New in the faith, middle schoolers, teenagers, mature believers bearing fruit. Which one are you? Amen. I want to take just a moment uh, of the service to speak to you directly. We have been doing these worship services and our prayerful pause with the pastor, our Monday through Friday daily meditations, for six months now. We have had over 400 viewers in a two-month period of our, these worship services and uh, just under 600 viewers of the prayerful pauses just two months. And we've been doing it for six months, and it appears we may be doing it for another six or 12 months. But through the miracle of technology, we have found ways to stay connected and even invite new people into our faith community. Maybe you are one of those. We have Zoom gatherings that happen every week. But the fact remains that we are a tiny church with limited resources. We are not supported by outside money it all comes from us. If you find meaning in our worship service, if you are touched at all by our daily meditations and enjoy how they make you think of something greater than yourself, if you find meaning in any of our Zoom groups, then we invite you to support us as you are able. For those who can contribute financially, the address and the electronic means to do so are at the end of this video. For those of you who may have some financial limitations or you find financial support is burdensome, we ask you to pray for this ministry. 
And let us all join now in singing the song that reminds us that everything that we have, all that we are, all that we will ever be, is a gift from God. Andy? brothers and sisters, since we last worshiped together, our nation has lost a pioneer who drew the circle wide, who proudly lived her Jewish heritage and Jewish faith. She was guided by the practice of her faith to welcome the stranger and provide hospitality to the sojourner. She was the second female and the first Jewish female justice of the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg eventually became the longest serving Jewish justice in our nation's history. And she is responsible for women enjoying the right to buy a home, to have credit cards in our own names, and so many more things, just because she thought it was the fair and right thing to do. Regardless of your political affiliation, I invite us to have a moment of silence, to give thanks for the faithfulness of this public servant, the only justice currently serving, who was a civil rights attorney before ascending to the bench. What a legacy she has left our nation. Let us pray. Holy and ever-living God, we thank you. We thank you for the life of public servants who dedicate themselves to the betterment of all of us. Help us to do that too, each in our own way. When our country and our community are so torn, Lord, remind us that you are the Prince of Peace, not just the peace between warring factions, but our own internal peace within ourselves as well. Guide us and guide our nation. Shepherd our leaders through the stages of maturity. Oh boy. Bring us out clearly on the side of justice, we ask. Instill in us a desire for you, Jesus, and for your way of confounding the world Help us to hold fast to what we know is true. Help us to hold fast to you. For in you we find the light that leads us to grow, to reach the next stage of our spiritual maturity. In you we find the growth that allows us to bear the fruits of the Spirit, to be your presence that feeds a world starving for hope. Make us, mold us into that, that you would have us be. For yours is the kingdom and the kingdom, and yours is the power to empower. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because of God, we have new life. Because of the Spirit, we have faith. And because of Jesus, because we are a resurrection people, we have hope. Let us sing about that hope with our closing hymn. Dios de la esperanza danos gozo y paz, al mundo en crisis habla tu verdad. Dios de la justicia manda nos tu luz, 
luz y esperanza en la oscuridad. Oremos por la paz, cantemos de tu amor. Luchemos por la paz, fieles a ti, Señor. Andy? God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with love and joy and peace. May the God of justice speed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace, singing, share our joy with Friends, whatever stage you are at in your journey, God is with you. And whatever your next point of arrival will be, Jesus is already there to welcome you. And whatever you're going through day after day, the Holy Spirit is alongside and within you to help you through it. We're not alone. Let us leave this service feeling the oneness with God, the companionship of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit today and every day. And let the church say amen. Have a blessed week. We'll see you here next time.
Thank you for joining us today. We're glad that you chose to worship with us and are grateful for your prayerful support of our ministries. We are a small congregation of about 50 members in upstate New York, but now we find ourselves growing to include some of you in Florida, Kentucky, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Jersey, and New York, all of us united by the spirit of the living and loving God. If you are watching this, we already think that you are part of us, and we would love to hear from you. If you would like us to pray for you, please send those joys or concerns to me through our website, which is on the end slide of this video. More worship services, as well as our weekday meditations, prayerful pause with the pastor, can be found on our YouTube channel, South Church Rochester. If you are in a position to help support us financially, your gifts may be sent to us as seen on your screen. I hope you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you back here next time. Just remember, transform your spirit, transform our world. Bye for now.